Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. The word of God for our consideration is recorded for us in Matthew's Gospel, the 16th chapter, beginning with the 21st verse. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem to suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. And Peter took him aside, and, and he began to rebuke him, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me, because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. And Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. After all, what will it benefit a person if he gains the whole world but forfeits his soul? And what can a person give in exchange for his soul? This is the gospel of our Lord. In the name of Christ Jesus, dear fellow redeemed, how could someone who, who got it so right get it so wrong? In the verses immediately preceding today's gospel, well, Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter responded with his great confession of who Jesus is. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then, just a few verses later, we hear Jesus say to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. What did Peter say that, that caused Jesus to respond to him in this way? And Jesus was now about two and a half years into his earthly ministry. Up to this point, he had mainly concentrated his efforts on teaching the people. But now, in these final six months of his earthly life, well, we see a shift. Jesus now focuses his teaching efforts on instructing his disciples. And previous to the events in today's text, well, Jesus had made several veiled references to his upcoming death and resurrection. But this time was different. Jesus makes it very clear to his disciples what would happen to him. Matthew writes, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and experts in the law, and be killed, and on the third day be raised again. And did you notice Jesus said he had to go to Jerusalem? There was no other option. In carrying out his Father's will to save sinners, well, Jesus had to go to Jerusalem. And there he would suffer, be killed, and rise again. And Peter, he, he can't believe what he is hearing, and, and he takes Jesus aside, and, and he rebukes Jesus, saying, May you receive mercy, Lord. This will never happen to you. For Jesus to, to suffer and die, well, that didn't fit Peter's picture of the Messiah and what the Messiah would do. Jesus, may God grant that this never happens to you. Where would be the glory in, in suffering and dying? And Jesus says to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a snare to me because you are not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. In other words, well, Peter, do you realize what you are saying? If I don't suffer, die, and rise again, well, well there won't be any forgiveness of sins. There won't be any heaven for anyone. And that's, that's exactly what Satan wants to happen. Peter, can't you see that Satan is trying to get you to do his dirty work? He's trying to use you to, to trap me and to persuade me to, to not do what I must do. Peter's problem was that he was not thinking the things of God, but the things of men. Although Peter, just a, a short while before, had correctly identified Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God, well, he, like the other disciples and many of the people of Jesus' day, they still did not correctly understand what the Messiah would come to do. 
They were looking for a, a political savior, someone who would free them from the tyranny of the Romans. Just think how, how glorious it would be if Jesus could make that happen. But how could that happen if Jesus was to suffer and die in Jerusalem? There was no glory in that. And although Peter may have thought his intentions were good, well, in reality, they, they were at the very least misguided. But certainly, they were in need of correction. And Jesus does correct Peter. And as he does so, he prepares Peter and all the disciples, not only for his suffering and death on Good Friday, but also for the hardships that they would endure as his followers. Jesus teaches the disciples and us that God's way is first the cross, then the crown. Jesus' suffering and death is not just one of the many possible solutions for the problem of sin in this world. No, it was God's only solution. Why was it necessary? Well, all people are born into this world sinful, and that sin, it evidences itself in our evil thoughts, words, and actions. We don't love God the way we should, and we don't love our neighbor the way we should either. We disobey what God in his word tells us to do and, and what not to do. And there are no exceptions. Scripture says all have sinned and fall short to the glory of God. And in his word, God tells us that because of sin, well, all people are deserving of his wrath and eternal punishment of hell. And on our own, well, there's nothing that we or anyone else can do to save themselves. The Savior is needed. And God provided that Savior. He is Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the only one who could rescue people from their sins. But for that to happen, well, in, addi in addition to living a sinless life, well, Jesus would need to suffer, be killed, and rise again. And in that first chapter of 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote, We preach Christ crucified stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. And that was true in Paul's day. It's still true today. As Christians, we continue to go out into the world and, and preach the gospel, that message of, of Christ crucified in payment for all sin. And yet the world rejects Christ. There are those who, who would rather believe that a Savior is not needed, that we can do something to save ourselves. Many consider it foolishness to believe that it was necessary for Jesus to, to shed his blood and die in payment for all sin. And to speak of Jesus and the cross as the only way to heaven, well, that's unpopular and considered by many to be unloving. Satan is still alive and well. And he has convinced many that his cross, or that Jesus' cross is foolishness and meaningless. He strives to convince you and me as well that, that sharing the gospel is just a, a complete waste of our time. So what do we do? Well, we, do, we do what Paul did. We continue to preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ cruci crucified because it is the only message that gives hope. We preach Christ crucified because well, it's the only message that forgives sins and opens heaven. Christ crucified is the only message that has the power to save. Paul writes, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Admittedly, well, God did do something that perhaps looks foolish by human standards. He hides his saving power in weakness, but in so doing, he redeemed the sinful world he bought us back from the power of sin, death, and the devil. And how did he do that? God's son who, who created heaven and earth, he became a helpless baby, born in a stable in a little town called Bethlehem. He who was true God became true man. Jesus, the, the son of God who never slumbers nor sleeps, lay exhausted in a boat during a storm. And the one who opens his hands and satisfies the desires of every living thing was hungry and thirsty. Jesus, who is life, died on a cross. And the one who is present everywhere was contained in a tomb. 
and weakness. God has shown his saving power. Jesus suffered and died for our sins on the cross. He paid the price of our sins in full. Through faith in Jesus, we have forgiveness for all of our sins. and We will one day be in heaven because of Jesus and what he accomplished for us on the cross. Still today, God hides his saving power in, in seemingly insignificant things. The one who created the world's oceans only hides his forgiveness in the applying of water and in the saying of the words, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And the one whose body and blood are the most precious of gifts gives those gifts to us together with the bread and wine when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. And the one who is truth, well, he quietly hides his truth in a book that we call the Bible. Jesus hid his saving glory in the cross and then turns around and, and hides his cross for all to see in baptism, the Lord's Supper, and in his holy word. It's been said that the message of the cross is the Christian's greatest comfort, but that doesn't mean that Christians will always be comfortable. No, as Christians, we will carry our own crosses while we are on this earth. Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. In fact, whoever wants to save his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Followers of Jesus carry crosses. But what does it mean to, to take up one's cross? Well, it might be easier if we state what a cross is not. A common misunderstanding is that a cross is every problem or challenge or setback that we experience in our lives. And sometimes we even hear people use the phrase, well, well, this is a cross I must bear to describe a problem that they are facing. And many of the problems that people experience in life are the direct result of their own sins or maybe the sins of others or because well, we live in a world that has been corrupted by sin. And they're felt by believers and unbelievers alike. But that isn't what is meant by taking up one's cross, at least for Christians. For a Christian, a, a cross is anything that we suffer for the sake of, of the gospel. It is suffering that we endure because of our faith in Jesus. And some examples of taking up one's cross might include well, the child who, who's ridiculed because he or she goes to church or Sunday school or a vacation Bible school. Or the Christian employee who insists on being honest in their workplace and as a result or gets passed over for promotions. Or maybe it's the Christian couple who are saving themselves for their wedding night, but instead of being supportive, other friends make fun of them. Or the Christian who tries to remain faithful to God and his word even though it creates tension with others, even in, among members of one's own family. And following Jesus will involve suffering and persecution for his sake. The world hated Jesus. It will hate his followers as well. And these crosses, they may come to us in various forms. Maybe it's verbal. Maybe it's physical. But no matter what form they take, well, as followers of Jesus, well, we will expect them to come into our lives. Scripture says we must go through many hardships to enter the kingdom of God. Martin Luther certainly was no stranger to suffering for the sake of the gospel. He wrote, we who would be Christians must surely expect to have the devil with all his angels and the world as our enemies. We must expect that they will inflict every possible misfortune and grief upon us. For where God's word is preached, accepted, or believed, and bears fruit, well, there the holy and precious cross will also not be far behind. Crosses we endure serve a purpose in the life of a Christian. In Romans 5, Paul writes, Suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. We can even rejoice in our crosses. In 1 Peter 4, we read, Dear friends, do not be surprised by the fiery trial that is happening among you to test you, as if something strange were happening to you. 
Instead, rejoice whenever you are sharing in the suffering of Christ, so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. But if you suffer for being a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God in connection with this name. Through word and sacrament, God gives us the strength to take up our cross and follow him. And as we carry our crosses, we give God glory. And through the crosses we bear, well, God serves our good and also his purposes. They are hidden blessings. But they also keep us focused on the glory that will one day be ours in heaven. At Abiding Word, we have one stained glass window, and it depicts what is known as Luther's seal. Martin Luther designed this seal to reflect his theology. And at the center of the seal, well, you see a single black cross. And the cross reminds us of how Jesus suffered many things, was killed, and on the third day rose again to forgive us all our sins. And Jesus promised, be faithful, even to the point of death, and I will give you the crown of life. The crown of life is what awaits us and all who follow Jesus. This is what makes the cost of being a follower of Jesus, including whatever we have suffered for the sake of the gospel, as being nothing and compared with what awaits us in heaven. The Apostle Paul said it well, our sufferings at the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is going to be revealed to us. First the cross, then the crown. Amen. In the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.